Good afternoon and good morning. Welcome to this one hour session of the Paris Peace Forum titled Everyone is Responsible Accountability to End the Pandemic. My name is Krishna Daikumar. I'm the director of the Duke Global Health Innovation Center and co lead for the COVID Global Accountability Platform. And it's my pleasure to be your moderator for this session. Now, over 20 months into this global pandemic that has disrupted the lives of billions, caused over 5 million deaths and over 250 million cases, world leaders are still struggling to undertake the collective actions necessary to end the global threat of COVID-19, seemingly without effective levers for accountability. Over 7.3 billion doses of vaccines have been administered around the world, but with staggering inequities in access. In Europe and North America, over 60% of our populations have received at least one dose, and over 50% are fully vaccinated. And yet, across Africa, only 9% have received even one dose, and only 6% are fully vaccinated. We're seeing similar inequities in access to testing, therapies, and critical supplies like PPE and oxygen. In this session, our distinguished panel of global leaders will address these current gaps and discuss approaches to accountability that can accelerate progress on targets and commitments and also empower low and middle income countries to lead efforts that quickly identify and access the support that they need. It is my great pleasure to welcome our panelists for this session. Ms. Gail Smith serves as coordinator for global COVID response and health security at the U.S. Department of State. His Excellency Mr. Hage Genga is the President of Namibia, and Mr. Mark Malik Brown serves as the President of the Open Society Foundations. For our viewers, please use the live chat platform at any time during this session to submit your questions, and please specify who your question is for. Now, let's dive right in, and I'm going to start with a question uh, to President Genga. Now, you, as um, uh, the leader in Namibia, uh, have experienced uh, COVID very differently than, uh, than many of us in other parts of the world. Could you please tell us about what that experience has been? And how would you assess the global response to date, including really how we're holding institutions and organizations to account? We may be having a, a, a challenge with uh, getting uh, President Genga up uh, connected here. So in the meantime, let's uh, let's keep going. And I'd like to bring in uh, Ms. Smith. Thank, Ms. Smith, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, now, the U.S. has really stepped up to play a much stronger leadership role in addressing the global pandemic over the last few months, including President Biden hosting the global COVID-19 summit in September, seven weeks ago and Secretary Blinken holding the follow-up foreign ministerial just yesterday. Now, what has prompted these stepped-up efforts, and what impact have you seen so far? Are we seeing a change in the trajectory? Uh, thanks so much, and I'm happy to be here with you, and thanks also for everything you're doing at Duke. Uh, our thinking in launching the summit uh, led by President Biden in September was that we needed to do a couple of things. We needed to get everybody into the room. We needed to marshal the political leadership needed, and we needed to create some real momentum. Uh, we had the summit, as you pointed out, Secretary Blinken convened foreign ministers yesterday. Our USAID administrator, Ambassador Power, will be convening her counterparts, and there will be another summit after the first of the year. But I think what's been really important with respect to the theme of this panel uh, we put out very ambitious targets at President Biden's summit. That was quite deliberate. Uh, some say these targets are impossible. It's our view that they are entirely possible, but it requires a degree of political ambition that, again, we need to mobilize. The second thing that's going to be very important here, and we're very pleased that Secretary Blinken was able to announce this yesterday, was a new COVID-19 tracker which combines the work of the multilateral task force the World Bank, IMF, WTO, and WHO, and Act A, so that we will have all in one place uh, the data, the analysis, and the projections we need to respond more effectively, but again, with enough transparency to make sure that we are all holding ourselves accountable. So we think the momentum, the ambitious targets, and the visibility on the tracker are things that will help us get to where we need to go. Fantastic. 
Thank you so much, and uh, and certainly uh, some follow up to come uh, in as we get going around some of the the efforts you've just named. Sure. But first, let me also uh, bring in Mr. Malik Brown to this conversation. Um, with the Open Society Foundations, you've certainly had a longstanding um, emphasis on issues like transparency and good governance. How have you approached uh, the response to the pandemic, especially gaps in accountability? And are there any bright spots that we should be learning from? Well, look, Krishna, thank you. And first, congratulations to Gail and the whole US team for the leadership they've shown recently on this. Uh, but, you know, there is an issue of raising and scaling the political will to the size of the problem. And, you know, President Biden's leadership is critical, but it's not enough. And, you know, we are in a situation where only some 14% of the 1.8 billion doses that developed countries have pledged have actually been delivered. So there's a sort of back ending of commitments into next year, which makes Gail's targets, as she rightly acknowledges, a challenge to meet. But we'd argue at OSF an absolutely necessary target to reach, a human challenge we cannot fail as a global society to achieve. We, to answer your question, look at uh, this through a human rights lens, and we think vaccine access is one of the most pressing human rights issues in the world today. When you've got you know, countries with only two, three, four percent vaccination rates, where in my country, the UK, we're up to close to 70, in the US, close to 60 percent, this disparity is not sustainable. And it's not only not sustainable in public health terms, it's not sustainable economically, and ultimately it's not sustainable politically because it's a little bit like we're seeing at the COP talks in Glasgow on climate, a reflection of a divided and therefore fragmented world. But just around this issue, like around climate, we got to find a way of mobilizing the will to show a collective solidarity, which is currently missing. Great, thank you. And uh, let me ask if uh, we've got uh, President Gig up uh, on yet. If not, uh, let me come back. Um, Smith, you mentioned the, the tracker that was launched yesterday, as well as setting some ambitious targets over the last several weeks, which certainly are, are positive movements in terms of what we need to end the pandemic. Uh, and Mr. Malik Brown, you brought up this idea of we need to really think about not just doing more, but doing enough. How would you both gauge what we're doing now? We seem to be doing more week by week, but is it fundamentally enough? So what else would you like to see to make sure that we're reaching some, some threshold of doing enough collectively? Sure. I, look, I think you've hit the nail on the head with this phrase of we're doing more, but we're not doing enough. And one of the reasons that the targets and the tracker are important is that this is a quantifiable challenge. We can actually measure what is enough. And I think to getting to enough, there are a couple things that are immediate and another thing that is also urgent but runs on a different track. First, uh, Mark rightly mentioned the issue of vaccines. We've got robust pledges from a number of places. We need those pledges to be translated into vaccines delivered as quickly as possible. And we all need, and this is something uh, we are working on very closely with COVAX, for example, is to enable the world to have predictability of supply. So the doses need to move faster, but everybody needs to understand when they're gonna move because you can't burden countries by giving them very short notice on the arrival of vaccines. Second, we've got to translate vaccines into vaccinations. And these are complex vaccination programs, even for countries that vaccinate often. I mean, in the United States, we had to lay on all sorts of things to do an accelerated vaccination program. We've got to make sure that we've got the resources and the support commensurate to the vaccine supply to help countries translate those vaccine to shots. The last thing, and we can get into this more later, I imagine, but, We've also got a structural systemic problem here. The global vaccine architecture was built to produce roughly 5 billion vaccines. It is also geographically distributed in a way that leaves us in the situation we face now. So the other track has to be increasing and diversifying geographically the production of vaccines and other critical medical supplies. And we can't wait to start that after this pandemic is over. We've got to put that in motion now. 
Well, yeah, look, Krishna, just, just to, to, to add to that, I think it's great that there's going to be one tracker because, um, I mean, you've been doing a fabulous job in providing data and there have been other data sources. But to be honest, governments have been able to a little bit hide behind the numbers because, you know, estimates of, of vaccine surpluses in being held in Western countries, uh, estimates of supply in the pipeline, all these issues have a little bit been missing. And I would actually myself even argue that your death estimate is maybe off because I like those who've measured, you know, total changes, un unanticipated changes in, in, in mortality, which you know, could mean we've lost as many as 15 million people from this epidemic because you hear more and more stories of countries in Africa, particularly Tanzania is a classic example, where simply the death reporting, you know, is so imperfect and, under the last president, President Magafuli, who himself died of COVID, um, you know, the effort to cover up and put any cause of death on the certificate other than COVID, you know, depressed figures in dramatic ways. So getting to shared, credible data is going to be absolutely key. But I think, you know, going forward, as Gail says, it's not just vaccines delivered, it's jabs in the arm. This needs strengthening of whole healthcare systems and you know many of us estimate that for every dose you deliver you need or dollar of dose you deliver you may need three to seven dollars of delivery support to support the public health system that delivers that jab you also in developing countries not got to repeat the mistake of earlier epidemics where you undermine critical existing continuing health programs against hiv malaria other communicable diseases and, you know, frankly, you've also got, at the moment, as it happens, quite a lot of instability and famine issues uh, in part of the African continent, which also can't be left unaddressed. So this is increasingly an all-encompassing crisis in parts of the developing world, at a time when in the North, there's a sort of beginnings of a sigh of relief. The worst of it's behind us. We're, we're expecting a normal Christmas, et cetera. And you know, there's a real danger that that complacency, because of our condition, blinds us to the growing crisis in developing countries, which has COVID at the epicenter of it, but is much wider in its public health, economic, a hunger, and political dimensions. Great, thank you so much. Absolutely, a few. Uh, issues to unpack there. Um, Smith, let me go back to the point you made that we still don't have uh, real transparency and predictability and timeliness in terms of what we're seeing in terms of vaccine supply uh, and allocation and delivery. We've seen everything from a COVAX task force to a US EU vaccine task force. Um, we've been talking about this issue for over six months. And as you said, this seems to be less about the data being available and less about the technical capabilities and much more about the political will amongst multilateral institutions, high income countries and manufacturers to create the transparency needed as a measure of accountability. What are we not doing that still needs to be done? Everybody's talked about it. Everybody's created task forces. What's actually going to solve that challenge? Well, I, I think you're right. This is urgently needed. And it's, it's both for accountability, but it's also for the practicalities of helping to maintain a global vaccination effort. Again, if we don't know, if COVAX doesn't know, but most importantly, if countries don't know what is in the pipeline and when things are coming, it's very difficult to plan. And that planning is key uh, to, as Mark says, getting jabs in arms, as is said in the UK. I think there are a few things. Uh, we are quite engaged with the major vaccine producers, uh, as is this multilateral task force. Uh, you may have noted that at the summit, we called for the transparency on production, delivery, and supply. Part of the challenge there is accuracy. Oftentimes, there have been delays in delivery, so we've got to account for that. I think for those of us with, that are sharing doses, we've got to be able to project, and we worked very hard on that with the uh, now 1 billion Pfizer doses that the United States has bought and <clears throat> donated to COVAX, we've got a regular schedule for the delivery. Now, there's some trickiness because we've got to adjust, more importantly, COVAX does, 
for the countries based on what flow is coming in. But I think this is something we can get down to the science and rhythm that is needed. Uh, I think we need to do that very quickly. I think the tracker is going to help us significantly. And I think also there's a demand signal coming from a lot of countries that are receiving these vaccines, that they need the clarity and the time to plan. And we've got an obligation to listen to that. This isn't just about donors. This is about, as Mark said, solidarity. This is about working globally. So we've got to also respond to that demand signal and very quickly. Thank you. Fantastic points there, especially around making sure that we have practical information to improve the effectiveness of all of our vaccination campaigns globally. Mr. Malik Brown, let me uh, come back to an issue you brought up, which is this divergence between, in some ways, the vaccine haves and have nots, where some of us are thinking about the post-pandemic future and uh, others of us are thinking about what the next three years of pandemic is actually going to look like. As we look toward the next two to three months, um, there's a second risk involved, which is that we're starting to see an increase in rates of infection, hospitalizations, and deaths in Europe. We know that in prior surges, the U.S. has largely been two to three weeks behind that, and we're seeing some potential indications of that happening. So well, on one hand, you risk complacency. On the other hand, you risk the same high-income countries uh, becoming more insular to deal with their own new waves. How do we make sure that the focus that the two of you and many others have, have rightly spent so much time making sure that the rest of us are thinking about that this is a global pandemic that requires a global plan of attack, how do we make sure that as the dynamics of the pandemic change that we don't lose that central message? I think it's a really good question, and Gail and I are veterans of decades of uh, developing world crises, which we've worked on together in different roles. And we know that the media spotlight, the attention quickly moves on, and it would be an absolute tragedy if, either because of complacency or, as you say, because of renewed infection rates in the global north, the south was forgotten. So, as a foundation, what we're trying to do about it is we've formed an alliance with fellow foundations, Gates, Rockefeller, Ford, MasterCard, SIP, uh, a number of others, including African foundations, Ibrahim Foundation, for example. Because many of us have somewhat different views on some of the longer-term issues like intellectual property rights around southern manufacture of vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. But we all have a collective sense of the shortcomings of the current response. Uh, that we've just got to scale that response up. And I think, you know, foundations have, in a sense, in recent years, possibly slightly lost one of their vital roles, which is to be a conscience in the societies in which they live and operate. Uh, and, you know, I think that's what we collectively want to do. We, all our combined dollars is not enough to fix the gap in vaccine financing. That must be done by government. But we do have the dollars and clout and the voice to absolutely press governments, as we are at this peace forum, to rise to the occasion, to scale up and not see this as some, you know, regional Africa crisis or Asia crisis like earlier pandemics were Ebola, for example, but to recognize this is of global consequence. Unaddressed, it's going to leave a sort of pandemic or, 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 or you know, short of that level of continuous infection in our societies. But it's also going to drive an economic divergence and a political divergence, which was going to really handicap global responses going way beyond this particular issue alone. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Smith, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I would, because I think this is a really one of the most challenging dynamics that as you rightly point out, the epicenter of the pandemic right now is Europe. There are countries around the world talking about third, fourth, and fifth waves. We know that the nature of viral threats like this is that they are cyclical and they keep moving around. All this virus wants is places where it can replicate, grow stronger, and mutate, right? And I think that there is a, on the one hand, there is a growing recognition of sort of enlightened self-interest. Everyone says all the time none of us are safe until everyone is safe. Uh, but I think there's still a threshold to cross in terms of the international understanding that is needed to get us to where we need to go. And that is that it is literally impossible 
to prevent and stop the cyclical movement of this virus around the world unless we tamp it down everywhere. That's not a slogan, that's a fact. Uh, I think media coverage gets that sometimes, but I say as a former reporter, I read more stories that are about individual countries or regions and less coverage. One of the things I'd like to see more of is again, is what is the movement of this virus around the world? Where is it going next? We've got to track it like the threat it is and understand that while yes, it is a threat and a challenge in national borders of every country on the planet, this is a transnational threat. And so we've got to look at both. What's happening in our own countries and how is this moving around the world? And I think that hasn't clicked yet to the degree that it should. The second thing I would simply add here is something on financing. And ending a pandemic is expensive. It is a lot cheaper than not ending a pandemic. And I think the other critical recognition for the international community, many of our mothers taught us that line that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's absolutely true in this case. And we need to be making more investments in the front end now to save resources. If you look at the trillions of dollars that the world has already spent, we can stop the bleeding on that end if we make the investments now on shutting the pandemic now. Thank you. Let's dive into that issue of financing if we can. Um, we have a new Act A strategy and an Act A budget that calls for $23.4 billion in funding for the next 12 months of Act A activities, which of course don't represent the full totality of the global response. And almost two years in, we still seem to be lacking a fully costed and agreed upon global plan. We're still struggling to understand how much it's going to cost, where that money may come from. Um, how should this financing issue be addressed? And how can we collectively bring more accountability to make sure that we understand what it's gonna cost and that we're not passing the hat around trying to raise that money month by month as we go? I think it's a really good point, Krishna. And, you know, there are sort of three estimates out there. There's a $23 million estimate, one you referred to. There's a $50 billion, which is the IMF, uh, World Bank, WHO, WTO one. And there's a sort of $75 billion, which is uh, the US NGO Care and the consultants they engaged to work with them. And, you know, we've got to get to clarity around the proper cost. And it's got to be a cost which is expansive enough to take in the healthcare systems needed to deliver this, uh, but sensible and realistic enough to secure uh, donor support. But we shouldn't just stop at the health cost. We've got to look at the parallel economic costs. These are economies which were not able to use the fiscal stimulus protection that Western economies did during the crisis. They really suffered severe scarring. Many of them are facing growing debt burdens and getting a parallel economic rescue package in place, reallocation of the IMF's SDRs, a large World Bank IDA in the order of $100 billion, but other grant financial support is as critical as just the health dimension. So these are very, very, very big numbers, but it's better to face them head on and to keep in mind Gail's vital point that they are a fraction of what it will cost to repair the damage afterwards if we let both the public health and the economic crisis uh, run unattended to. I, if I may, I would just add something to that, that I think you're absolutely right, that we've got a lot of numbers uh, floating around. Two things on that. Part of this is how you scope the cost. Is it there's a cost for the continued work of Act A, which is absolutely critical. The bank and the fund put a larger lens on that. And what Mark's just pointed to is the need to finance not just the core pandemic here, but if you will, the shadow pandemics, the impacts on macro economies all the way through to livelihoods. The impact, for example, that we're seeing in education, in food security. We've got to look at all of those in their totality. We've also got to look at the other side of this, and this is one of the concerns, is that even with the costing that was done in year one when Act A was first created, the world didn't meet those financing targets. And part of the challenge, I think, for donor countries 
uh, is that we're not going to be able to finance this if we rely exclusively on our foreign aid budgets. We in the United States have been extremely fortunate uh, that we've had bipartisan agreement in our Congress that provided us with a significant amount of additional funding uh, to finance this response. And that's going to be key for all of us. We can't do this on the cheap, but the flip side is, and just reinforcing my own point, but also Mark's reinforcement of it, it will cost a lot less to end this than it will to fail to do so. And the more we can make that point, the more people who may be listening can let your governments know that you get that, that you want your governments to do that, and that you will support them when they do that, because look, governments are under pressure all the time to spend more money at home. The closer we will get to that. So I think hearing from voices of citizens in this is also absolutely vital. And I think, Krishna, if I may, I mean, this, you know, this forum is sort of very, from its beginnings, has been very devoted to promoting the idea of multilateralism. And, you know, this crisis has put that choice starkly before all of us. Do we reach for a multilateral solution of global solidarity, or do we descend into a kind of nationalism, my country first model? And, you know, this goes wider. I mean, we've got lots of sort of nationalist leaders out there who we don't need to guess what their answer to that question is. But it's what are the great democratic leaders of the world going to do? Are they going to give in to that sort of atavistic uh, look after one's own first? Or are they going to rise to the challenge? And I think, you know, this is something that this forum is very well placed to reflect on and needs to send out a real sort of trumpet call loud uh, that, you know, this crisis, like the climate crisis, requires us to kind of get back on the multilateral track because there's no other way to solve it except through that shared common burden sharing approach. Great, thank you both. And uh, maybe with that point, let's talk a bit about the multilateral approach, including the multilateral leaders task force. And now, um, Smith, as you pointed out, the launch yesterday of the new uh, global COVID access tracker as a joint effort between that multilateral leaders task force and Act A. And let me uh, come to you first, and then Mr. Malik Brown. Um, how do we think about the the translation of that data to real insights and the translation of those insights into action, whether that's new investment, new policy, new uh, programmatic implementation, uh, we've seen over and over as we've unearthed more and more data that hasn't actually changed people's decision making. Um, how do we now think about almost the the inside game with the official tracker and the the outside game with uh, with other non governmental actors also playing a role in, in ways um, as as Mark you said the consciousness of uh, of some of the efforts that are going on. So let me come to you, Ms. Smith, first. Sure. Uh, look, I, one quick note on this tracker. This is going to evolve over time as more data is uploaded, so we'll be able to tell us more and shine more spotlights on more over time. Um, I, I think what this does, and in my experience, and Mark noted that he and I have worked together for many years wearing many different hats is that there's something that starts to happen when you can project the stark facts on a screen in quantifiable terms. Here is the gap. Talk about the implications and then convene the people that all need to be in the same room to confront it and say, what are we going to do about it? And that's why, for example, this next summit that President Biden announced in, in September is key. Uh, that's why in the ministerial, there was a very good discussion about the stark facts of where we are and what foreign ministers need to do to drive this forward. So I think there's a, a critical piece there that sits between what you call the inside game and the outside game. On the inside game side, I mean, one of the things we are doing is constantly meeting and convening at different levels with our counterparts to roll up our sleeves and say, how are we going to fill this gap? Uh, urging other countries to do more, urging our international institutions to do more. I think in the outside game, we all know when that data and information is out there. Where it shows progress, it tends to be credit for that. But where it shows gaps, 
there will be public pressure, public advocacy. Uh, in many cases, for example, with our Congress, where we've, again, had extraordinary bipartisan support for global health broadly for over 20 years, the visibility of those gaps often inspires them. So I think it creates the opportunity uh, for citizens, parliaments, others, to provide, again, the momentum we need to make the outside game and the inside game come out at the same place, which is doing enough and not just more. Mark, thoughts on the, the outside game part of this? Well, look, yeah, you know, I, mean, I think it is absolutely critical because, you know, in a way, this is a hard issue for politicians to get their heads around. It's very easy to, in a sense, sort of see the problem as over there, uh, not not at home for all the reasons we've, we've discussed in this uh, in, in, in this call. And therefore, again, one comes back to how important the Biden and Blinken uh, leadership in terms of trying to coalesce uh, a, a global response is. But, you know, just to give you a sense of the, the capacity of the multilateral system today versus when we had the global AIDS uh, crisis, there was then a Secretary General, Kofi Annan, who immediately, you know, placed himself at the head of efforts to respond to that crisis, worked very closely with the American administration of the day, a Republican administration, George, President George Bush. And, you know, one of the that president's greatest achievements was PEPFAR, the program, you know, to provide affordable HIV treatments uh, in Africa. But it was part of a much bigger global achievement, which led to a new international uh, organization, the Global Fund Against HIV, Malaria and TB. Uh, it led to pressure on pharma companies to produce HIV vaccine uh, treatments at, at, at a marginal price point. There was a sort of coherence of international leadership that has been missing in this crisis. You've got a committed president in the US, you've got a committed president in France. You had those both last time as well. But somehow beyond that, there's been neither the sort of groundswell of leaders from North and South to come together around this, or the leadership at the global level to bring it together. And so you know, what you've got is you know, every day you pick up the newspapers and read another example on the social media of a country falling short and the tragedies uh, it's, it, it's, 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 it's living with. But that has not been brought together into this kind of cohered, scaled response. And, you know, I don't think it's, well, it's late, but it's not too late. And if we could use this Paris Peace Forum to sort of kick up our game uh, and raise that sort of external political pressure, I think it would be critical. Thank you. And, and picking up on that, um, Smith, coming to you, as you noted, there have been decades of experience, whether it's with the HIV and AIDS, Ebola, other global health emergencies. Um, what should we be learning from those experiences in addition to what we just heard uh, that we can apply more effectively in this pandemic? Um, that's a great question, and I'd say a couple of things. Uh, one of the things we are learning is where many years of support for global health uh, has also built the capacity and strength in health systems and where it hasn't. Um, we're seeing some very interesting things. PEPFAR that Mark mentioned, the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, which uh, was pretty boldly launched by George Bush at the time. Uh, we were pleased in the Obama administration to dramatically increase funding for PEPFAR, and it is now, uh, I think, pretty much of a U.S. institution. Uh, one of the things we've seen there is we've been able to use the PEPFAR platforms, for example, for vaccine delivery and to track where PEPFAR has been successful at building capacity. To, to Mark's point, and he made this point about healthcare systems, uh, I think we all need to take a look at how, even as we're dealing with immediate global health challenges, we are also layering in the capabilities that are needed for countries to manage their own uh, health systems. So I think that's one really, really important lesson. Another lesson uh, that I think is a, a challenge for all of us, but one that's surmountable, is that the world rightly defines this as a global health emergency, and it is. 
there's sometimes a tendency to say, well, we've got great health experts around the world. We've got health ministers. Get out there and solve the problem we're with you 100%. The fact is that we also need finance ministers. Uh, this is also an economic crisis, and that's why the importance of the G20 agreement on the joint finance and health task force. We need foreign ministers to marshal the cooperation and political leadership that we needed. That's why we did the ministerial. And so we've got to be able to define this crisis in multiple ways. Those of us that have been in global health for a long time all know what we're talking about. We all speak the same language. The points are clear. When we're communicating with people that come to this from another perspective, another decision point, we need to also frame this for what this is, which is an economic crisis, a uh, humanitarian crisis, uh, and a political crisis, a security crisis. So I think that's the other lesson. The global health community is strong, it's firm, it's largely aligned. We need to communicate with those outside the global health community uh, to join forces to get jobs like this done. Yeah, such an important point that we, we often don't take the time to incorporate. Uh, as we go, um, let's talk about you know, both the, the Global Fund and the PEPFAR model especially, and um, some of the evolution has really been about localizing those efforts, creating capacity and leadership in low and middle income countries. We saw this as a major aspect also of the new USAID strategy and Emma Smith certainly you know, that was a, a part of what uh, your leadership at USAID also um, uh, led to. In this global response, how do we think about shifting the, um, the nidus of, of power but also of conversations from places like New York and Washington and Paris and Geneva to actual low and middle income countries. How do we ensure that there's more uh, low and middle income country leaders uh, who are leading this conversation and helping to strengthen the, the pandemic response overall? Mark, let me come to you with that first. Yeah, well, look, I think it is very important. And, you know, I hear of countries, for example, Bangladesh, where a very sort of dynamic UN resident coordinator and a country which has deep public health experience and very strong NGOs in the public health space like BRAC, you know, is coming together, government and um, uh, civil society, national and international, the UN. And, you know, they really have been planning the sort of distribution and strength and health response at the country level. And in Africa, you've got the extraordinary leadership that the African CDC has shown, you know, something that came out of an earlier health crisis post Ebola, but which has really proved its worth with great leadership and, 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 and data on Africa. What I think you need to avoid is saying, well, everybody has to have a voice, so we need to use something like the UN General Assembly. Everybody does need a voice, but what we need is country plans as well. And, you know, it's really important that we could just stimulate the global will and then translate that into the means to allow smart country plans to deliver both vaccines and healthcare, health delivery capacity. We, we'd be in a better place, but I think you know, a lot of countries have sort of rather given up on this. Their view is that the vaccines they were promised never came. And, you know, I began by talking about complacency in the North. I could also complain about lethargy in parts of the developing world where just despair that the vaccines never seem to be coming, the reminder that there's always these other more traditional killers like malaria uh, and hunger. You know, all these things are combining to mean that the eye has got taken off the ball of getting ready to be able to vaccinate people against COVID. So this, this mobilization of political will is not just a northern problem, it's a developing world problem as well. And, you know, in, ultimately, you know, we can sit in Paris or Washington and preach, but it does need national leaders to seize it. And as Gail has said, to seize it not at the level of just public health crisis, but systemic societal crisis, which you know does risk institutions, social welfare, uh, economic future, and political stability. And you know their response needs to be on a scale and a seriousness which reflects that. If I can add to that, um, 
Look, I think that's a really, really important question. And one of the things that was uh, very good about the ministerial that Secretary Blinken convened yesterday is that uh, he had counterparts from all regions. Um, this wasn't a conversation primarily among donor countries by any stretch. And this is a global challenge, and it really is going to require global leadership. And I think changing that dynamic so that it is a broader conversation is great benefit. You always learn something, which we can always benefit to do. But, but let me give you an example. I want to build on something Mark said about the African CDC in a, a place where uh, I think we've seen an important shift in some dynamics, but one that we need to build on. Uh, that is that, as Mark pointed out, uh, Africa, despite having, and I'm seeing a big sunlight on my screen, it's, we've just done daylight savings time. It's morning here. Uh, apologies for that. Um, the Africa CDC has been critical, but the continent that has the lowest vaccine coverage, what did it do? Under the auspices of the African Union and the leadership of the chair at that time, President Cyril Ramaphosa, it developed a continental strategy. It empowered the African CDC, which, as Mark rightly says, is a real force for change and progress. Uh, it built its own supply chain uh, to manage the need for PPE and other medical supplies and formed a vaccine acquisition task force, which actually purchased vaccines for Africa. When they were in the process of doing this, they said to us and to the world, meet us halfway. We will do our piece of this, but you need to meet us halfway. And that's very much informed our work with them. We're pleased to be working with the Vaccine Trust to coordinate their role in the vaccines and ours. Uh, we were able to, for example, recently work with them and Moderna uh, to facilitate an arrangement that will allow, again, it's the African Union buying more vaccines, but us taking delayed delivery of some vaccines that were headed towards the United States. But this meeting us halfway uh, is, I think, another element of this localization that we really need to focus on. There are very few countries out there that are just waiting passively for the world to help them. They've got COVID coordinators. They've got healthcare workers that are out there. They've got governments that are engaged. They are spending their own resources, uh, and in many cases, to great disadvantage in terms of long-term economic stability. So I think part of our challenge is not to look at this as a linear, we're donors, we need to transfer resources. But if I can use the word partnership, which is overused, it really, these need to be strategic partnerships where we are really doing these things jointly. Thank you. And yes, I think pointing out the the, the young but very capable um, work of the Africa CDC is a, has been a fantastic highlight of, yeah. of some of these efforts over the past 18 months. And uh, I'll uh, put in a plug for the first uh, conference for public health in Africa that's coming up in December 14th through 16th. It's going to tackle many of these same challenges uh, based on and led by Voices in Africa, I think, as another really important part of, of this conversation continuing and, uh, and evolving over over time, and I know uh, both of you and, and many others have continued to support the work of uh, the African Union, the Africa CDC, and and much more work on the continent. Um, staying on this uh, localization, um, Gail, I want to come back to a really important point you made about manufacturing and the need for um, distributed geographic manufacturing as a key component, both of current pandemic response, but also of future preparedness. And we've got some questions here about uh, what we think the components are, as well as how to get past some of the bottlenecks. There clearly has been work on everything from um, actively facilitating private sector companies to come to the table for voluntary licensing. There's been a lot of talk about uh, compulsory licensing as well as the issue of a TRIPS waiver, uh, which the U.S. has supported but doesn't seem to be making much progress at the World Trade Organization. Um, what do we think are the, the critical barriers or what can we do now? And we've also seen, uh, I should point out, some investments come in both from the private sector, but also from places like the International Development Finance Corporation from the U.S. Yeah. that led uh, some of this work as well. So uh, how would you assess the progress that's been made so far, and how might we accelerate that piece of preparedness and response? 
Um, great question. I, I think three quick points on that. There's a lot we can do now. Um, we in the United States, our development finance institution is uh, the Development Finance Corporation, and it's recently been expanded in its tools and capabilities uh, by legislation supported by both parties in Congress, so that's great. Uh, the DFC has been able to make investments uh, in South Africa, in Senegal, and in India that are increasing production and or laying the ground for increased production. Uh, there are a lot of development finance institutions, the IFC, as you mentioned, there are those vehicles and institutions that can start making these investments now, so that's number one. I think number two is we've got to remember uh, it is not just vaccine production. There are what's called the consumables, the elements of a the vaccine. There's PPC, PPE. There are other urgent medical supplies, and now is the time to look at what is that diversified investment portfolio uh, that reduces the, in many cases, acute dependence of entire regions uh, on imports, when it also makes good investment in economic sense, creates jobs to build on some of these capabilities. But we've got to diversify the portfolio. Every country we meet with is eager to have a vaccine manufacturing plant. I totally understand that, but there's a whole set of investments that need to be uh, made. And third, I think the more we can think about how do we think about this globally in terms of, if you will, strategic planning? One of the things we've seen, we mentioned the African Union, we have seen more discussions going on at regional levels about how regions deal with these crises, whether it's the need for maybe other regional CDCs or, again, this issue of manufacturing. How do regions think strategically of the manufacturing capabilities they need by region? Uh, so that's another piece I think we need to think about. Now, yes, there's much more to be done. Uh, there are barriers in the way. Um, we are all working at knocking some of those down, but I think we can't let that preclude what many of us can do and do more of right now, because this is also the time to move on this. If, if I may, I mean, I completely agree with Gail. And I, I think, you know, we, we are using our impact investment arm of being looking and encouraging investments and in setting up manufacturing capacity in Africa. And we all know there are various projects now which are developing quite fast. But two points. One, you know, the mRNA technology was developed not to treat COVID, but other communicable diseases. And so the potential use in Africa is across a whole menu of illnesses, not, not just COVID. And so the potential market for manufacturers there is going to be long term. It's not going to go away if we crack the COVID problem. And so this is suddenly a very strong commercial possibility that Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson all understand. But they also understand the politics, or I hope they understand that the politics about licensing, et cetera, you know, has to be addressed. But I think we will see uh, a series of investments. But Gail is right. They've got to kind of be on a regional basis. It's like the old development conundrum when every country wanted their own national airline. It doesn't work economically. And so there's got to be a regional strategy. But my second point is one of the biggest disruptors of developing country vaccine distribution in the, the last nine, 12 months was what happened in India, where there was big Global South manufacture and uh, COVAX and others were counting on it, uh, the its production of the AstraZeneca vaccine to meet a lot of its global demand. And then, hey, presto, there was a dramatic surge in COVID in India and all the supply got reallocated to the national use, which is, of course, what happened also in the West. So really strong regional manufacturing hubs with absolutely robust built-in strategies of regional distribution that doesn't leave anybody out is, is going to be part of the solution to this. Uh, we, we've got to just you know, recognize the reality of countries grabbing for their own citizens first, but try to build around that a system for the future which has enough supply on a quick enough basis to overcome that, and which again reflects the principles of solidarity, not just of my country first. 
Well, thank you. I think really important points to keep in mind as we as we move forward with with this pandemic, as well as uh, for the future more broadly. Uh, let me turn to another really urgent issue. We've uh, spoken a lot about what we've seen work and not work with vaccines from the research and development into manufacturing and, and equitable access. We're now on the cusp on the therapeutic side of having very effective and safe oral antivirals, uh, which could again be a game changer to layer on top of vaccines and public health strategies and, and all the other tools that we have. And now we're talking about potentially the ability uh, to manufacture um, antivirals based on technologies and capabilities that exist more broadly and are used in HIV and AIDS uh, medicines and the like. Uh, what can we do now in this moment of urgency, but also potential to make sure that all of these decades of learnings from where we initially failed in the global HIV and AIDS response, how we came together around the global fund and PEPFAR and the two years of, of experiencing in, um, in this response, how do we get this part right? What are the, the most important pieces to make sure that we don't repeat some of the inequitable access challenges for vaccines as we think about what's on the horizon for therapeutics? Um, Gail, let me start with you. Sure, I'd say a couple things on that. And one of the things I would strongly advocate is that many of us have worked on the HIV AIDS epidemic for a long time and I think have acute awareness of the lessons learned in terms of the amount of time it took to get to the point where ARVs were affordable and so on and so forth. I think, quite frankly, that story needs to be told. There is a profound lesson there in terms of uh, both the impact on lives, but our ability to bring that epidemic to an end. So I would encourage people uh, who've worked on that issue for a long time, not everybody in the world's worked on that for a long time. So, so telling the story of those lessons in real terms is really, really uh, important. Small plug to my colleagues at Duke, you'd be well positioned to tell that story among others. Um, I, I think the other thing, I mean, one of the interesting things recently is the arrangement that was made by Merck with the United Nations Patents Pool. And I, this is something, a tool that can be used. Uh, it may not be the ultimate long-term solution, but it's a really good uh, path forward whereby companies can say, in the case of therapeutics, come to an agreement with the patent pool. They are therefore uh, able to license others for production and during a specific period of time, neither the originator nor the licensee collects royalties. It's a way to get uh, new innovative medicines into the system very, very quickly. And I think that's important. It kind of flew under the radar uh, in terms of awareness that that happened, but I think that's a really, really positive sign. Uh, I think also that we need to take the lesson from vaccines and what we've learned uh, certainly about the, the problems in the system, but also the outcomes. What has it meant that, again, the world was not positioned to respond to this pandemic in the way we needed to? And then what does that, that tell us about how we need to approach uh, a global response based on the exciting developments we're seeing in therapeutics? Thank you. Yeah. I, I would just say a couple of points. I mean, one, at the beginning of this uh, pandemic, the countries that had experienced SARS or Ebola or particularly showed you know, much earlier robust responses than regions which had not. So, you know, you, you did see, particularly in, in parts of Asia, but also uh, parts of West Africa, you know, much more robust lockdowns than occurred in Europe or, or, or the US. And you know that was the direct experience of how you contain these diseases. So I think in some ways, you know, we we will never react the same way again now that we've all globally uh, seen COVID. But I think Gail's point about the longer lessons is really critical. I mean, in the UK, our public broadcaster, the BBC, has been doing some very reflective programs about HIV, which is sort of 40 years old now since its discovery. Uh, and it took, of course, a long time to get to the point of you know, a real global containment strategy. And along the way, are the dramatic stories of presidents like 
Thabo and Becky in South Africa, who continue to deny the seriousness of the disease. He has his contemporary counterparts and people like President Bolsonaro of Brazil. So, so this issue of, of you know really getting countries to accept is you know absolutely key as 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 you you go forward and so i think there is a huge amount of lessons to be learned and of course already you know various leaders have come together to do pandemic reports on lessons learned and preparedness for the future uh, President Alan Johnson Sirleaf, former president of Liberia, and Helen Clark, former prime minister of New Zealand, have done a really um, important report on how to prepare for the next uh, crisis of this kind. And, and, you know, the key issue is to not let governments sort of move on and move past it, to, re to really take on board the lessons. And, you know, I think then finally to your point about the, the, the oral uh, medications, antiviral medications now coming on the market. Now, we are moving in the West, despite, as you point out, the increased infections in rates in Europe, towards an issue where this is a terribly damaging disease, but, but, but for all but the most vulnerable groups, the unvaccinated or the elderly or those with health risk, ultimately a manageable disease, even if it requires a hospital stay, et cetera. So you'll move from, you know, a mortality cost to an economic cost and a displacement of all the other things you should be doing in your healthcare system. But it will have sort of moved off the front line of, of the daily sort of death certificate, the death statistics. And, you know, that also, you know, risks it receding in terms of public priority. Uh, and, and so I think we've just got to keep on pressing the message. This isn't over till it's over everywhere. Thank you. Well put, certainly. Um, we've covered a lot of ground here today, and we're nearing the end of our time. So let's see if we can try to put some of these uh, pieces together. And I'll ask uh, each of you, uh, Gail, perhaps to start um, in about 30 seconds, which I know is not enough time to put anything together, but uh, from everything that you've done and are continuing to do, is there a, a single piece of advice that you would leave people with that are um, that are hungry to help do their part in, in the response and bring stronger accountability? Uh, I think two quick things in 30 seconds. Uh, hold people's feet to the fire with the facts and the evidence, and I think we'll have more tools to do that. We've got targets and we've got trackers. I think the other thing that's important, and I say this as somebody who's served in government, now this is my third time, but also been one of those people on the outside saying do more, is give credit to leaders and institutions that do the right thing. Uh, give them the shout out, that matters also. So hold accountable, but, but reward accountability. Yes, great advice, thank you, Mark. Uh, Chris, I mean, I think, you know, I, we, we've done our share of shouting out here because I think Gail and uh, President Biden have been real leaders on this latterly. Um, but I think, you know, and as has President Macron tried to be here in Europe, but, you know, this has got to get scaled up. This has got to be every leader everywhere, you know, putting their hand on their heart and reaching out their hands to their counterparts and saying, this is a global problem we've got to fix together. And I, on behalf of the foundations, will go on holding their feet to the fire, as Gail puts it, you know, until they do. This has got to get scaled up. This needs a level of seriousness and scale, which is currently missing. Great, thank you both. And I'll just add, we're, we're trying to do our modest uh, part in helping hold uh, feet to the fire and also recognize exemplars and success through this new global uh, global accountability platform in many ways to complement the official tracker and, and a lot of the work that's happening through multilateral channels. Uh, first, I want to thank you both for your fantastic perspectives and your time, uh, but also really for your amazing 
tireless efforts, not just uh, related to the COVID pandemic, but across your uh, illustrious careers and in, in helping to improve the health and the state of the world. Um, uh, very grateful for all of the work that both of you continue to do. So uh, thank you to Ms. Gail Smith, to Mr. Mark Malik Brown. Thank you also to the Paris Peace Forum for this opportunity to, to have this important conversation at this point in time. And thanks to all of our viewers and audience for joining today. Have a very good uh, afternoon and morning around the world. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.